everybody? All right, are we awake? Or are we just sitting there doing class credit? Is that what it is? No? All right, everybody do me a big favor. These magic machines, turn them off, put them on vibrate. Because I'm gonna do you like I do my classes at Auburn when I teach there at George Mason. And if I hear the phone, I get it. And then I get to find out all your little dirty secrets. Okay, so do me a favor and, and mute it or turn it off, I appreciate it. Um, thank you very much to everybody for coming. Because I know some of you, I was watching you kind of sign in. We used to do that here in the music department when we would do uh, student recitals. You had to do X number of student recitals and get credit for going as part of the music students. So I understand that. I had to do it when I was in college. But even at that, I really appreciate you coming out tonight. It's absolutely an honor to be back here at the university. It's been a while uh, since I was here as a professor of military science. And I tell people that when I, when I got here, I was in Germany, and I got a phone call saying, you've been selected to go to be a professor of military science department chair. And oh, by the way, you have two weeks to move. And I said, you're crazy, you're on drugs. I hung up the phone. Went ski for a week, came back, and the Army called me back and said, okay, you now have one week to move. So uh, I said, well, where am I going? They said, well, you're going to Kearney, Nebraska. And I'm back, you know, Brandon, back, this was before the internet, so I'm like looking up and trying to figure out where in the heck Kearney, Nebraska is. And I was really not thrilled about coming out here, as you can tell from the accent. I'm not from Nebraska. I remember seeing stories of blizzards and everything. But I can tell you that once I got out here, I fell in love with the city. I fell in love with the campus, and more importantly, I fell in love with the students. And one of them is sitting, well, he's actually standing now in the back, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Will Prusha, who is with the National Guard here and is working with the ROTC department. Uh, one of my senior cadets uh, was here, and as I told Will, working with them and working with the students and having a chance to to talk about leadership and watching them develop as our future leaders. When it was time for me to leave, I was kicking and screaming that I didn't want to leave Carney, Nebraska. Uh, so to be able to come back is an absolute thrill, and it's an honor. A lot of great memories here. Um, my daughter was a junior loper. In fact, I was telling one of the professors in the back, I rigged it with the athletic department so that she was junior loper card number one. <coughs> and she still has it in her memorabilia box. Uh, my daughter is now a first lieutenant, soon to be captain in the Air Force, serving as a physician assistant. And when I told her I was coming out here to Kearney, she was trying to say, well, can you figure out how to get me out there with you? Because I'd love to be out there and have a daylight donut with you. <laughs> but, it, but it was a great time. Uh, when I was here, it was Kearney State College, and then we transferred to become the University of Nebraska at Kearney. Um, Having a little bit of sense of humor and some fun with the cadets, we said, well, you know what? Um, we're, not, we're not really not Kearney State College, and we're kind of like the future Nebraska, so why don't we just take the letters U and K and put the F in front of it for the future University of Nebraska, and we could be the funky battalion. What do you think? And I was like, that's awesome. Why don't we do that? So we were going to get shirts made and everything, so it's like Ranger School, it was plus 25 for initiative, but minus 50 for lack of judgment, because the provost found out about it and canned the idea immediately. But I thought, that would have been a great t-shirt. I'm sure we could still be selling them today as the funky uh, battalion here at Kearney. But it was good to be back. It's good to see a lot of the, uh, the city. A lot of things hasn't changed, but then there's also been a lot that, that has changed. And change is a good thing. Um, but tonight, um, I've been asked to talk about, about a couple of specific ideas, one of them leadership, but I was also asked to talk about veterans and how we kind of fit into the leadership mold. But then I also have found out since I'm standing here that we've got students that are in supply chain management classes. How many of you are out there that's taking supply chain class one? No, I saw a whole bunch of folks. What is it, class 188? I mean, there's a whole list of folks out there that you're in different classes. Um, how many freshmen do we have here tonight? Yeah, quite a bit of freshmen, all right? So I'm gonna to try to figure out uh, as we go along uh, what it is that I can maybe offer to you as well, especially being new to campus, new to college, 
and then kind of maybe give you some ideas from, a, from my perspective that might be useful to you tonight. The best part of it, unless your professors uh, have said something different, there's no pop quiz, okay? So you don't have to take notes. Uh, there's, there's no quiz at the end of the lecture tonight, and it's going to be more of a dialogue. I'd like to hear from you more than I want to hear me talk. So if that's all right with you, uh, once I have a few words here, I'm going to turn it over and we're just going to have some fun tonight. Does that sound all right? But before we get started, I want to say hello to a special friend. Dr. Annabelle Zygmunt and Dr. Dale Zygmunt are in the back. Um, I'm so thrilled to have them here. The reason is, um, as he mentioned, I was the ROTC guy, but I also taught classes in the music department. And you go, well, how did that work if he was a major in the military at the time and he was teaching in the music department? Well, I was a piano major in college and had a low draft number. But I still, so that's why I got in the Army. I mean, hello. Uh, so I signed up, but I still kept up with my music because I enjoyed playing. And one of the things that I really enjoyed more than anything playing was not to be the soloist, not to be the concert pianist. I like working with choral work, and I like being the accompanist. That's what I did I, in church. I was always the church choir pianist and all that. So one day I got bored in the, in the uh, ROTC department, found my way into the music department, and talked, I believe his name was Dr. Smith. He was the department chair. I think his name was Smith, or maybe not. Annabelle will have to help me out. But I asked him if he needed some help with teaching some of the piano classes, the piano lab, et cetera, and that started it. And then I met Dr. Sigmund, and um, she needed an accompanist for some of her vocal students, which is right up my alley, and then we became great friends. The idea was I was actually going to stay here and complete uh, my doctorate here, retire from the Army, and continue to teach here and become a member of the Kearney community and hopefully live here a long life and work in the music department and have a great time. But the Army had other, other ideas. So that's how all that worked. So why am I telling you a boring story about being a military guy in that? Is because it all had to do with opportunities to lead. It all had our, uh, examples on how you can be in one thing and do something else. Nowhere does it say that you need to make up your mind and do it today and say that's what I'm gonna be forever. Um, people will tell you that well, when I grow up, I'm going to be a firefighter, or I'm going to be a, a piano teacher, or I'm going to be a doctor, or whatever. And my advice is, if that's what you really want to do, then go do it. But just be aware of your surroundings and other opportunities that may come up. That, that, that might take you down a different road, and you'll have just as much fun, or figure out a way that you can combine the both. How you can be a helicopter pilot in the Army and play the piano at the same time. And then put the two together when you have an opportunity like working here at a university. Those are great opportunities that you can look at even as you are here at the university campus. So what can you do there? So when it comes to leadership, um, you have leadership capabilities and qualities sitting right here in this room. And you sit back and go, well, wait a minute, I'm only 17, 18 years old. Uh, my parents don't even listen to me. So if my parents don't listen to me, my sisters and brothers don't listen to me, why do you think I have leadership capabilities and qualities? Because you do. One, because you're leading yourself. You've accepted a role as a college student that brings you in, that requires you, unbeknownst to anybody else, that requires you to come in and take charge of your own life, and then that invests itself into your friends and how you then become where you are working with them to help them achieve their goals and aspirations as well. But as you do this, you need to also consider what kind of reflection does that take when you're working on that? Does it make you feel proud? Does it make you feel that you provide value added? Does it make you feel that as a group that you have something to contribute? And at the end of the day, at the, when it's all said and done, can you look back on what you've done during that day and be proud of your actions and be proud of what you've accomplished? And if you can do those things, then you're, you're on the right path to uh, being a very, very successful student and most importantly, a very successful citizen in our country. And that's important, especially on a day like today where we are voting for our new leaders. 
One thing about, um, how many, do we have any of the ROTC cadets here tonight? Any ROTC folks? I recognize a couple of them sitting over there. Okay, great. Um, you know what makes it unique about that? Um, about 30% of the nation's youth, age 18 to 25, can qualify for military service. 30%. So those of you that are looking at, at the Army ROTC, you have already shown demonstrated qualities of leadership because of how you can qualify in that 30% category. From business perspectives, you, along with your classmates here, and it'll be future college graduates, you are going to be looked at in a very, very fine uh, manner as somebody who is a step above and where those business people want you for opportunities because we still have people who don't go to college or we have people who go to college and they don't graduate. So you are already going to be in that finite group that people from a business side as well as from a mil military side are looking at that for what you've demonstrated with your own self-discipline and your own leadership capabilities that you're bringing there. So what is it that you, that you bring when, you, when you're looking at, at a leader? Especially from a veteran. I'm going to kind of slide over talking to uh, the cadets right now a little bit because I didn't have a chance to talk to them today. Uh, so what is it that you're bringing to the classroom that you're demonstrating a little early now? Uh, things like teamwork. Things such as performance under pressure. How you can take something and then put it to the side, focus on what you've got to do, and continue to achieve that. The respect for procedures. And when I say respect for procedures, it's how the classroom is run. What the professor is expecting you to do and how you do it and organize yourself to accomplish those goals. The fact that you have integrity. Those are very important key leadership qualifications that will work well with you in the classroom as well as when you leave Harney and go out into the business world. So as, you, as you're looking at some of these qualifications of leadership, I would ask also, and this is where I'm gonna kind of say, well, let's have a little discussion. Let me ask you, and this is where we're gonna have a little, little fun here, if I were to ask you, what, what do you define as a leader? What would, what would some of your answers be? So take a second and then think about it. And then let, let's ask, what would you define as a leader? And today is a great day to ask that question as we're going to the polls and vote from the President of the United States, our future <coughs> Commander in Chief, right down to some of our state uh, and local leaders. So what are you looking for? What's some of the characteristics that you would define that would make a good leader? Anybody? Don't everybody jump here at once. Yes, sir? A voice. Pardon? A voice. A voice, okay. Um, when you say the voice, are we talking about the TV show, The Voice, or are we talking about what kind of voice? Okay, a voice that speaks up and communicates. All right, so we're talking about communications. We're talking about somebody who can r rise above the fray and be able to be heard, uh, be able to take a, a thought and put it into a succinct concept and deliver that message that's clear and precise, maybe? Something like that? Okay. What's, yes, sir? Someone who provides purpose, direction, and motivation. <laughs> All right, so we have the Army ROTC coming in here. What is it? Purpose? Purpose, direction, and motivation. Purpose, direction, and motivation. All right? I would buy into that. Somebody that can, that can provide guidance um, and motivate. Okay? So when you're talking about motivation, you're talking about being able to get people to do something that they might not even consider that they want to do, or if they want to do it, that they can do it. Right? So you're motivating them, you're instilling that esprit de corps, you've got everybody lined up behind you, you're all walking down a central path, aim for a mission, you got it, okay? So it's somebody that can get that excitement going into a group, right? Okay, I saw a hand back here. Yes, ma'am? Someone who has courage. Courage? All right, there's a good one. Courage. If you had to define courage in 25 words or less, what would you say? <laughs> 
Can we get a mic? Yep. Or, yeah, so you just thought you were going to be sitting there, but we got the roving mic. <laughs> I just said someone who's brave. Who's, brave? Um, fearless. Fearless? What about principles? What about ethics? What about diversity? If we were to take some of those ideas and roll them up under somebody who has courage, how about if we looked at someone who says, I know what's right, and while those sitting by me may not agree that it's, that it's right, I've got the courage to stand up because I know it's right. And even in, even in the sense of diversity, even when we're trying to instill diversity and inclusion, especially on a college campus, and you got your OMA <coughs> office just right down, down the hall here, so when you stand there and you see something that's not right, do you have the courage to stand up and make it right? That's leadership. That's leadership. When you're not expecting anything to happen for you personally, but you want it to happen for the common good, that's leadership. That's courage. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Say uh, listening and situational awareness. Maybe. <coughs> okay, kind of two different things. Uh, tell me a little bit more on the listening. Uh, well, I mean, when you're leading people, everybody responds to things differently. When you're leading people, everything, everybody responds to situations differently. And you have to be able to listen to that individual and know, you know, how am I going to get them to, for that motivation, so to speak? How am I going to motivate them? You have to listen to what they're saying. And then situational awareness, uh, just kind of build on top of that. You know, how am I going to respond to something in a certain situation? Am I going to be stern or am I going to be uh, kind of messing around and, you know, is it, it, what, what type of situation is it? Is it something where I can't be messing around or something and I, I need to be stern and put my foot down on? Right. <clears throat> well, one of the key elements is being able to differentiate when it's time to lead and when it's time to follow. And those that can understand when it's the appropriate time to follow, they become the teammates. So you become the leader of the team, and at some time you become the teammates. And I'll give you an example. In the Army, especially with some of our cadets here and our senior cadets coming up, they're going to be placed in leadership positions. They're going to be in junior leadership positions, so they're going to be learning from those around them, from their non-commissioned officers, from their sergeants, and from their warrant officers, what it takes to run that outfit, that unit, that unit cohesion that comes from that. So that sometimes they're going to be asked to lead. They're going to be told, you're the platoon leader, you need to lead. Other times they're going to be asked to be in the staff section, to be, to be that person that provides the staff support, the team effort to make sure that that unit that's being led gets what they need in the resources. So sometimes you're the leader, and sometimes you're the follower or the teammate. The one who understands the marked difference and can be supportive of both sides comes out ahead as an overall respected individual. It's when you have somebody who can't understand that, and even though they're back here supposed to be the teammate, they want to constantly lead. They want to constantly throw in their ideas. They want to constantly tell people, well, we really need to be doing it this way. That becomes disruptive. And to me, that's not a strong leadership trait at all. So does that, that kind of get in, into that one? Um, so, so that's why, to me, it's very imperative. Sense of direction is also something that you might want to also consider when you're leading somebody. You've got to have a set purpose on where you want the organization to go and how you frame it so that everybody feels that they're part of the organization. Um, I'll give you an example. And I, I just gave this to some of the, the cadets earlier this morning to the seniors. So guys, bear with me over here because this is a rerun for you. Uh, how many people know Legos? Oh, come on. We all played with Legos, even back in my day. Uh, Legos. And that was the best thing about having kids. You know, kids get the cool toys. And so the toys that you didn't get to play with, when you have kids, you get to play with them, and they're really theirs. So uh, Legos was really big in my family. So when I took over the organization, it was called Employers Support the Gardeners, or work for, for a couple of presidents running this organization. Nationally focused organization. I had staff in every state and territory. Uh, but the one thing that they didn't have when I, when I took over as I'm visiting with people, they just didn't have this sense of direction and they didn't have a sense of teamwork. 
And if you're going to be a leader, you've got everybody to understand we're all for one common goal under the purpose of direction, and we're going out with the, with the same set of principles and leadership guidance. So I, I was trying to figure out how I could portray that. And for those of you that know me a little bit, I'm big in pictures, okay? So I tried to give an example. And I thought of Legos one day, playing with the, with the kid. And so what I would do is I would tell people, okay, look, here's, here's how we are going to be as an organization. My headquarters, we're going to lay the foundation for the organization. So we're going to do that by revamping our policies and procedures and our documents <coughs> and methodologies and how we do things. We're going to come up with a strategic plan. We're going to lay out the guidance on here's what we need to accomplish and kind of the map to get there because the old saying, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Um, so we're going to get rid of that. We're going to actually have something that you can latch onto and see where we're going with the organization. So we did that, and I said, that's all those black pieces that are just laid flat. That's the foundation. Everybody in the organization, and this is where you can sit around here tonight and look around the, the room here. If a picture of this is full of people, look just like you, different colors, shapes, sizes, male, female, the whole thing. And I said, you are your own Lego. You have different characteristics, different shapes, sizes, missions, capabilities, qualifications, etc. But you're all here for a common purpose. And so what I want you to do is I want you to take your Lego piece and I want you to put it into the big Lego. And we're going to build a big Lego that says, and for us, it was ESGR. And what you can do is you can take that same example here in, in the classroom tonight, if you want to call this a classroom, and we can do the same thing and say, we're going to build our own Lego, we're call, going to call it UNK. And it's all going to look different in different sections, because as I mentioned, we're all different shapes and sizes and colors and functionalities, etc. But we all have a common purpose. But as leaders, we're all developing that as a simple concept, and we're all going to get together, <coughs> we're going to make that together, we're going to be led by, by the single force, and we're all getting behind the leader, or at times when we're asked to leave, because one of us may be in charge of building the K, one of us may be in charge of building the U. And so when we do that, that leadership qualifications and capabilities and uh, examples will come out. And so that's what we did. And people understood that, and they got behind it. Um, a lot of that organization was the largest volunteer-based organization within the United States Department of Defense. And when I left, we had over 5,000 volunteers active in the organization. When I took over, we had somewhere around 2,000 and something. So people bought into it. They understood it and they felt good about it. So as a leader, the other thing that I'm getting into is that the people that you serve, that you lead, they must feel good that they're, they're part of the organization, that they have something to contribute, and that they're recognized for it. You don't have to give them awards. You don't have to give them certificates. But if nothing else as a leader, what you should do is always go by and tell them thank you for what they're doing. Let them know that they're appreciated for what they're doing. Let them know that the time spent, the hard effort that they're doing in support of you as a leader, in support of what you're trying to accomplish, is very important to not only themselves and their group, but also to you so that you can let them know. Because of that handshake will go a lot further than any piece of paper that says thank you very much on it. So again, as a leader, let them know that they're appreciated. Any other, any other traits on, on leadership that you can think of? Feedback. Pardon? Feedback. You want to provide like positive feedback or like uh, tell them if they're doing right or wrong? Yes, kind of an extension about what we talked about, um, where you, you go by and you, you literally take time to thank people. In my ESGR job, I can use that as another example. I had a travel budget, um, and so I would fly to the different states and sit down with the, with the staff and with the volunteers. And the one thing I kept telling the Secretary of Defense is, because he said, you're always gone. You're never here in the Pentagon. You're always traveling. And I said, well, yes, sir, I am, because to me it's very important to get out there to the field where the people are doing the work on the ground and tell them how much I appreciate what they're doing, especially the volunteers, because they could be taking those hours that they're working for us, and they could be working for their church or their synagogue or the Boy Scouts, or they could be doing something else, but they're not. And they're doing it 
for what we're doing for the veterans, they're doing it for the Guard and Reserve and the families of the Guard and Reserves. So it's a two-way street. I want to first thank them for what they're doing and the hours spent and the great support that they're giving the organization because they're not getting paid for it. But I also want to know why they're doing it. You know, you always want to know why. If somebody's doing something great for you, ask them why. Sit down and talk to them. Find out why. You know, why, why are you doing this? Because you'll learn from that that you can then take that and, and carry it on and maybe entice others to do the same thing. Any other traits? Charisma? How about consciousness? We kind of hit it on, on that a little bit. Social boldness? Um, we kind of hit it on that a little bit when we were talking over here. The being aware of the social um, makeup that's going on, especially within the organization, and how you can, can develop that so that uh, you don't become too thin-skinned, kind of thick-skinned, that you do it at the right time and place. Um, self-assurance how about that one you ever known a leader that wasn't self-assured kind of a bambi pandy leader you ever seen one of those if you did they didn't last long um, why would you want to follow somebody that really didn't know where they were going you know because if you did that you might end up being in that road to getting you to nowhere because they don't know where they're because they're not they're not divisive they're not decisive and they could be divisive in the whole organization <coughs> CEO with that what about maturity you want an old gray-haired guy like me standing up and leading you all the time no I don't because that's not a quality just because I got gray hair doesn't mean I know what I'm doing I mean Dr. Sigmund will tell you that if you watch me play the piano like, how many years you've been playing this thing you need to go practice some more. Okay? So, so you, need, you need to not be convinced that just because appearance is going to what makes a good leader. What about words? What about words? What about language? And I don't mean the skills, but I'm talking about how they're delivered. What are they saying? When you stop and listen to somebody, what is it that he really means? Are you excited about it? I mean, when you hear somebody talk, are you excited about hearing them talk? I remember as a kid growing up and listening to President John F. Kennedy. When President Kennedy talked, you wanted to hear what the man said because you knew he was a leader, he had charisma, he was good looking, um, he was smart, he was aware of his surroundings, he was aware of the conscience of the nation, he was aware of where he felt the nation needed to go and how it needed to get there, and he needed people to buy into it. But he also had what in his speeches? Excitement. He had excitement in the things that he talked to the nation about. That's what you want to see in a leader. You want somebody who can excite you to do something, that can convince you that no matter what else is out there, no matter what is going on in your surroundings, that person or persons with your help is you're going to be able to achieve whatever goals you're after that you want to achieve. It's that excitement that you can do it and that you will do it. And that's what I remember growing up with some of our young, with the leaders during my younger days. And my lessons learned listening to them. All right, one last, uh, one last question. What can I do for you? I've stood up here and rambled for a while. Uh, and I appreciate the attendance. I don't plan on making this a late night event. I saw the calendar from 7 to 8.30 and I was like, I would never survive an hour and a half lecture. Why in the world would I think they would? Um, when I had night classes, we used to bribe the professor to see how fast we could get out. I'm no, just kidding. Um, well, maybe, maybe we did. It's football night. Anyway, um, what can I do for you? What can I, when I say that, I mean, I can't change grades, um, but what can I do for you? Is there something that um, I hadn't talked about that you were expecting to hear tonight that you'd like to, to hear something about? We've got some great folks in the back um, that can add in there. Uh, if there's anything, because you've got the students here, is there something that you'd like, uh, like addressed tonight or discussed? Um, would it be worthwhile? Uh-oh, I see one of them coming. I think I just opened Pandora's box. Just a quick question. Yes, sir. Um, 
Colin Powell in his primer, leadership primary, talks about uh, not having all the information you need to make make a decision. I think he says you have more than 40 percent, but less than what 70 or 80 percent. You go with what you got, and then you don't second guess your decision. You subscribe to that based on your experience? Absolutely. And I'm a product of the uh, of the military system, especially the Pentagon, where we will study everything until it is dead and buried, and then we'll still study some more before we ever act on it. And that just drives me crazy. Uh, we've got a problem. We identify what the problem is. We come up with courses of action and how we think as a team we can fix it. We stick the leader out there to go do it. And then we wait because we don't have that last little bit of information. I'm for the 90% rule, 80 to 90% rule, and that's just a number. Once you've got something that you think you've got right and you need to move out, move out and start working on it. Get your team involved, get them informed, assign the duties, assign areas of responsibility to them. You know, delegate as a, as a leader. Nothing's worse than working in a team and have one person do it all because they're the leader. And you sit back and twiddle your thumbs. Now, some people like that, get, you know, get paid, twiddle their thumbs. But most people, especially college educated people, that doesn't fit in our characteristics. We don't want to just, we want to be doing something. So get out there and do it. Um, an example of that is in the military, we have operations orders. And operations orders are what you really do, your due diligence, you plan the operations well, you've got all your resources put together, you know who's gonna do what, you know, as you move out, who's going to be on your left side and who's going to be on your right side. You know, if you're getting your artillery support, how many helicopters are coming in, when your food's going to be there, you've got it down to a detail. That only works until the enemy gets involved. Okay? <clears throat> because the enemy didn't, you know, didn't necessarily subscribe to what your great plans are and how you're going to win this thing, because they usually have a voice in it. So as soon as that happens, then we have what we call frag orders. And those are things that come down, and it's just real quick. We need to do this. Okay, we were going left, now we're going to go right. Here's where we're going to go right. We need helicopters. They'll be there tomorrow, and you're going to start changing stuff. Same thing happens in civilian life. A plan is only good until it's time to execute. Once you execute the plan, you need to have the ability to change. And I've seen so many organizations and so many people they get so lockstep into, well, this is the plan. I mean, it's like tonight. I have a notebook of presentations that I'm giving here on the campus this week. I think I know what I'm gonna say, but I'm not reading it verbatim. It's just giving me some ideas because I wanna go where the audience wants me to go. I wanna answer what you need, not what I think you need. So you need to have adaptability. Leaders can and must change, but when they do change, they must be able to relay why they changed to the team so that the team now has buy-in that we're now going left instead of going right. And you can only do that with so much level of information. If you wait until you have it all, the team's either going to go around you or they're going to leave you or you're just not going to get the mission done, be it military, be it civilian, be it classroom, be it whatever. Did that answer your question, sir? Yes, sir. What characteristics do you see most leaders lacking? In this day and age, honesty. I mean, I just flat tell you, at least in the circle that I'm in, uh, and what I see, especially in the political side, um, it's, 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 it's a degree of honesty and openness. And the buzzword, in case you haven't noticed it, but I believe you have, because most of you are very smart, is this word transparency. Anybody not heard the word transparency here lately? How many of you believe that everything that we see and read and hear, especially in the government, is transparent? Yeah, there's a clue, right? So as a leader, how do you fix that? As a military leader, how are you going to fix that? How are you going to tell your troops that what you're doing and what you're leading what you're telling them is the truth? How are you going to do that? Well, you've got to do it by showing them by example. If I'm telling you I'm going to tell you the truth, 
And you got to do that. And you damn well better be telling them the truth. Because somebody's going to find out. And this day of social media, I mean, it's a lot scarier than it was when I was growing up. Because right now, everything I'm seeing and doing is on that little machine back there. It's going to be on YouTube within a, within a few minutes after I, after I step down. So it's out there. And that's why transparency, honesty, to me, is, is one of the biggest lacking characteristics of some of the national leaders and local leaders. So how do we fix it? Well, we're probably not going to change them as much as I would like to. Um, people just get set in their ways. They've been successful, be it right or wrong. So how do we change it as a nation? How do we change it in the university? How do we change it in, in our classroom? It starts right here. It starts right here with every one of you that are sitting down in this session tonight. It's when you sit back and go, you know, I'm not going to play that game. I want to be a leader. I want to be the best that I can be. I want to be truthful and honest to my friends, my church, my God. And that's what you have to do. And it all starts right here. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Um, just from kind of a leadership standpoint, I know a lot of us here are busy throughout whether or throughout our leadership position on campus if we have them or if we're trying to have them. How do you balance your leadership position and your personal life or whatever it is that you're doing with school at the same time? How do you <clears throat> excuse me, how do you balance the leadership positions and everything else? Mm -hmm. It's called priority of effort. You, you have to prioritize at that time what's what's the number one thing. And where it gets interesting is when you have the one to ten list, and then when you start to prioritize, everything's a one. Uh, that's where you kind of have to do some soul searching and really say, is this more important than the other? I'll use an example. Uh, where's Colonel Prusha? Uh, National Guard member. His whole career, he's had to balance three big things in his life. He's had to balance his military requirements. He's had to balance his employer civilian job requirements. He's had to balance his family requirements. Oh yeah, the family, they get a boat, you know, in this thing, the wife, the spouse, the kids. So on any given day, how did Colonel Prusha decide what was gonna be more, more important? Was it gonna be the classroom? Was it gonna be the study hall? Was it gonna be my leadership role that I've got to plan for the next couple of days? How am I gonna do that? Time management and priority of effort I think is what's key. The other thing that, that doesn't get taught much, um, and I taught it to my daughter, and she, she used it in college, she still uses it now in the military, it's called the backward planning process. Anybody not know what that means? I mean, come on, if you don't know it, raise your hand. I mean, you're not, you know, this, again, this isn't testable. Now, you're on YouTube for not knowing it, by the way, you know that, right? <laughs> I, mean, I just want to make sure, you know, it's transparent. You know, we're all transparent now. Now, the backward planning process is very easy. You know what you've got to do. Let's say, for example, you've got uh, an exam coming up. You know when the professor is going to give you that exam. You know when that final is going to be. And you know in the back of your mind what you feel you need to do to prepare, prepare for that. Okay? So you hit the date that you're going to do it, and you start backing up timelines of when you need to do certain things to get ready for it. You add in a little fluff because we're all human, and you're going to get up one day and go, well, according to my thought, you know, it's probably a good day I should probably study for that, that exam that your professor back here that's watching your answer. Um, you know, just kidding. Um, so that, you know, so that you're ready for it, but you go, it's just, it's just not going to work today. So you have a little flex in there. It's not rigid. It's, it's movable. You can change it around. But the fact that you've got a plan, and then what you can do is, as a leader, you can get other people to buy into that thing and you can have group studies. And then you can have somebody that's responsible for a certain section of that plan that's gonna help you all be very successful when you take your final, because it's all gonna be the same test for everybody in that class. So instead of putting it all on yourself, have a group and lay out a plan, you can do that. And you just back it up, you kick it off, and you'll be better prepared when it comes time for those, for those exams, just as an example. Carry that all the way through and it'll work. It'll work for you. Very easy, time management, priority of effort, and use a backward planning process. And you should be fine. All right, anybody else? Oh, here we go. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, I 
I'm going to have you get the mic. And by the way, if there's questions asked and you don't hear them, let me know. I'll repeat them. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I was going to ask, um, in your personal experience in a leadership role, what was um, one of the biggest challenges you've learned? Hmm. One of the biggest challenges I had um, was actually confronting a superior when I knew they were wrong and I had to have the intestinal fortitude to call them out on. And the risk is that that superior also was the person who wrote my report card that, that would eventually have an impact, impact on whether or not I was going to get promoted in the military. And I'll give you, I'll give you, I'll tell you exactly what happened in this particular, and there were others, but this particular one, I um, had gone to become an Army aviator. So I wasn't an infantryman anymore. I was now flying helicopters, so I was a cool guy with the shades. Um, <clears throat> flying to Germany, junior Birdman, and we had had a very tough um, deployment. So we all came back. The enlisted guys and the NCOs had just done a, a fantastic job in supporting the unit. So we all decided to have a uh, hangar party. And so in Germany, if you're going to have a hangar party, that means you're going to bring out cases of German beer and, and food. And so that Friday afternoon, it all cleared, had the, germ, had the beer party going, everybody's having a great time. And the general calls up and says, I need a helicopter. And I need one in about an hour or so. So I said, well, that's okay. I wasn't drinking the beer anyway, so I'm good to go. Uh, because in the Army, there's no drinking and flying. Absolutely taboo. You know, that's, that's how you get in trouble. So I said, well, I'll fly the helicopter. I'll go get the old man flying wherever he wants to go. You guys keep on partying. Well, the boss I had at the time had two things going for him that wasn't right. One, he always wanted to be in front of the general, uh, that kind of person that had to, had to be Mr. You know, front page. And two, he really didn't care for anybody's opinion. He was the boss. He was the commander. He really didn't care what you had to say. So I'm sitting in the aircraft and we're warming it all up and I've got my sergeant crew chief sitting ne next to me. We're about ready to take off. And here he comes in his flight suit with his gear on and he walks over and he grabs the door, opens it, tells the crew chief to get in the back in his normal duty station. He crawls in the left seat of the helicopter, straps in and says, let's go, Lieutenant. And I said, sir, I don't think so. You've been drinking. He says, yes, and I don't care. I'm the commander, and we're going to go get the general. I said, no, sir, we're, we're not going to go get the general. So we had this little tennis match for a few minutes, and I said, sir, I'm the commander of this aircraft. I'm the aircraft commander. You've been drinking. You need to get out. And he says, I'm ordering you to fly. And I said, roger that. And I looked at my crew chief, and I said, I said, Sergeant Galloway, stand by. And I picked the aircraft up to a hover, I set it back down because in Army rules, as soon as you bring the helicopter, you are now flying. Okay? And I said, sir, I'm shutting down the aircraft and I'm logging a complaint against you to the, uh, to the boss. And he said, yeah, right. And I did. And he got relieved. And to me, that's what it takes to be a leader because I was not going to put my crew and I wasn't going to put my passengers and my aircraft in harm's way because some guy was on an ego trip. And he finally had to be told no. Now, he could have easily, before he left, wrote up a report card that said I was whatever. And while not being very specific, he could have put a particular, instead of a, a good mark, just kind of a mediocre mark, well, in the Army, mediocre, you might as well just put me at the bottom. Uh, he could have done that. And I was prepared for that. Fortunately, he didn't. Uh, and here I am, not as a former lieutenant, but as a colonel. So. But that's, to me, that's what it takes. You're just going to have to come to grips and do what's right. What you feel is right, what your values, your characteristics, your beliefs, they all come together sometime, and that's going to define you as a leader. And how you portray that and how you show that example-wise to your 
your classmates, your fellow employees, your family, your friends, that's going to denote what kind of leader you are. And I, I really believe that what you're doing now and how you're kind of forming that up and fi really finishing it at this age, that's what you're going to have for the rest of your life. What you are today is pretty much what you're going to be. I see a lot of but some of you know exactly who I'm talking about in your classrooms and in some of your churches and stuff like that. I mean, you you got a picture of that person. It's like, mm. so yes, sir, in the back. I know I can project, but oh goodness, <laughs> I need that. Can I borrow that voice? <laughs> I have a question to raise. Uh, it kind of goes back to your Lego concept and whatnot. And also with the uh, concept of the uh, episode within the helicopter and a few other organizational things. And that is that um, I often live in a leadership role that I'm not a problem solver, I'm a problem giver. And as I, boy, everyone who's off on that one, YouTube's not going to pick it up. <laughs> uh, but ultimately that, that dialogue of enabling people and I think many times our constituents believe that we know everything. Uh, and that premise about being a, a problem giver is much better than that of being a problem solver. And I'd just like to hear some dialogue about that. Well, one of the characteristics, I don't think I mentioned it, or if I did, I might have glossed over because it's not ringing a bell right now. To me, a strong one, and I think I've kind of hit it, hit around it, is honesty. You have to be honest with two things. You have to be honest with the people that you lead, but to be more, but to me more important, you have to be honest with yourself. You have to know what your capabilities are, you have to know what your limitations are, and you have to know what your knowledge base is. And that's where we get into the part about the title of tonight, when to lead and when to follow. If you if you feel that you're not where you can be that leader, there's nothing wrong with that. Work with the person who is and learn from that person, especially, and I mentioned this to the, uh, to the lieutenants to be, when they're thrown out there, they, they, they're, you cannot rush the calendar. You can't gain fast experience. It's going to come, but it's going to come at its own pace. So when you need that extra help, reach back and get the people to advise who have done that, your non-commissioned officers and your warrant officers, and build off of their experience. So having the honesty and the forethought to be able to develop that characteristic is to me where it's all coming. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people, and you're absolutely right, sir, is that a lot of people will say, well, he's in this particular position, or he was given this, this leadership role, so he must know everything, that's how he got it. No, no. And honest presidents of the United States will tell you that when they accepted that oath of office and walked into the Oval Office that first day, they realized not where they were as far as being the president, they realized what they didn't know. And then from that, they had to then learn the job. And they learned it by working with those who could help them, wise counsel, etc. And that's where you form the team, that's where you lead the team, and that's where you become successful. Understanding the honesty that's required both within and without. Did that help? Thank you. Yes. How would you make uh, teamwork more efficient? Teamwork more efficient. Well, um, for me, it's making sure that people understood the value that I expected that they had, that they brought to it, and that I respected their value. Because instead of me trying to do everything, I had the team doing everything. There's nothing wrong with delegating, okay? There's nothing wrong with having a, a group project and everybody sitting around the table and saying, well, I'm good at drawing and I'm good at computers and I'm good at Excel spreadsheets. All right, well, you got this one and Mary, you got this one and Sam, you got this one and all that and we're going to get together and as a team leader, you get it done. That's efficiency. That's, that's effective leadership. That's, that's efficiency of effort versus as a team, and you say, well, I'm the team leader, but I'm going to be up all night because I've got to draw this thing and I've got to do this spreadsheet and I've got to make these slides and get ready and then you guys let me know how I'm doing. That's not efficient. Uh, so that's, that's, one, that's one example uh, that I can think of off the top of my head. 
Does that help? And then you're sitting there going, but there's got to be more. But really, I mean, when it comes to efficiencies, look at look across the spectrum. Um, supply side, um, supply chain management. I mean, go back to your N6 Sigma stuff, if you guys still do that. I mean, that was all about trying to find bottlenecks and trying to figure out efficiencies and productivities and production lines. Um, how to make it better so that you're not wasting effort, <coughs> you're not wasting resources to end up with the same thing down the road somewhere. So how do you do that? And then you design it and you work that way. Yes, sir? Uh, kind of building back on the efficiencies thing. Uh, some, sometimes uh, there's a lot of construction guys here tonight. Uh, and sometimes in the construction field, we, you, you'll find guys that are really good at one task. Uh, it's not necessarily the most fun task. And in fact, a lot of times, it's a terrible task. It's not fun to do, but they're really good at it. How do you prevent those individuals that you're leading from getting burned out? Ah, that's a great question. What happens in, in many organizations, many volunteer groups, um, even in the military, you know who your good folks are. You know who the people are that's going to get it done, come hell or high water, right? So what happens is you've got a, a stable of 20 horses and you ride the same three or four horses every project, every day, and yes, guess what's going to happen? Those horses are going to get burned out. And the others are going to still stick around. They're going to enjoy the barn and eat the eat the hay. So how do you do that? You delegate the, those actions out to those people, and you make them work. Okay. One of the easiest things to do is to keep falling back on well, who I've got this, and I really need to get it done. Now who's going to get it done? Well, Fred and Sally are the ones I can always rely on. So here we goes, Fred and Sally again to get it done. That card will only work so many times. Then you're out of that card, then what are you gonna do? So the best thing and advice for me, having done it myself, you fall into that trap because of the pressure that's placed on you is, and it's easier said than done, is don't do it. Don't do it. Make the others work. If they're in that field, if they're in that unit, if they're a volunteer in that organization, they really wanna do that, make them do it. Because what that's going to do is it's going to make them really realize, do I really want to do this? I mean, if I'm not happy doing it, maybe this isn't the field for me. And I think some of you freshmen out here, you may be undecided right now on what you want to do. Well, get your feet dirty. Go try something. Find out if you like, like it or not. Because it's easier to find out now that you like it or don't like it than be able to change until you get further down, down the road, you've invested a lot of time and effort, and now you feel like you're locked in. Ooh, I really don't like this. I really should have been this in college, or I should have done this major. I've, I've already invested so many years, and you know, mom and dad, the money's gonna run out. You know, the parent scholarship program, you know, the funds end after a while. So you really need to think about that. And just be, remember I said, be honest with yourself. Now, nobody's going to be more honest with yourself than you. And do what makes you feel good. I mean, so at the end of the day, remember when we talked right at the very beginning, at the end of the day, when you go down your little middle checklist, did I do these things? Then you can look back and go, yeah, that was a good day. And I'm proud of what, what I did. And then also proud of what we did if you're working on our team. Does that help? All right, how are we doing on time and effort? Yeah, getting close. Now yeah, I got the, the axe man back there. So but I'll be here as long as I mean, even when it's not the formal under the YouTube camera, you know, I'll be be happy because to me I get energized. Anytime I'm around the youth, I mean I suddenly feel young again. So I enjoy this. Anybody else? Any last things? So let me just close by saying uh, thanks again for allowing me to come. It's great to be here on campus. It's great to be back with the student body. I love it. I, it's, I like being um, asked to come and, and present. I like giving lectures. I ask if you ever, if I'm ever back in town and you're interested, I do one that even the kids can enjoy, and it's how to live your life by the rules of golf. And, uh, and that's a lot of fun. We actually do some golf. So uh, we act, you know, it's how do you live, how to live the rules how to live your life with the rules of golf. 
And uh, so anything like that is a lot of fun. I enjoy I enjoy working with uh, with students. Always have and always will. And uh, to the veterans out there, uh, thank you very much for your service. It's a special week for us, as it is. Um, as I tell people, just because I retired and took off my uniform doesn't mean I stopped caring about the veterans and their families. So you know, I'm excited about being here. If you're really bored, you don't have anything to do. Uh, I think Friday on Veterans Day, uh, I'm going to be uh, the speaker at the Fountain. Remember it is? Yep. yep. Um, at Friday at noon. Friday at 1230 at the flagpole is at the center of campus. Please come because it's really awkward to be standing here talking to three or four people on campus you know, on a Friday afternoon. So love to have you. Promise it won't be the same speech. Um, it will be a little bit more formal, I guess, because I have to play the role and you know, it being outside. And I don't know who all from the leadership is going to be here, but, but I would love to have you come um, and be there, participate. And above all, um, remember why, it's, why we're doing Veterans Day, you know, to be there and be a part of that, because it's, it's an inherent thing that our country, I don't believe, pays enough attention to. Uh, we're too captivated with what's on our reality show. We're too interested in what's on our cell phones. We're too interested in what's going on in the news. And I think we just need to stop and reflect why we are the country as we are for 240 something years. And what made us where we are, it's from our civilians and it's from those who stepped up and led and served. And so that's a way that we as, a, as an organization, as a university, and as a, a civilian body can come out and say thanks beyond just a handshake and a palm. Actually recognize those that have gone on before us and those that are currently serving that are in uniform today. So uh, I'd encourage you to come out. Bring your friends. It's the power of small numbers. If you come, bring somebody with you. That means we'll have twice the crowd. It'll make me look a whole lot better on TV. No, just kidding. <laughs> so, uh, but I would like to see you come out. And again, thank you for coming. It's been an honor to be here. I look forward to talking to you on the floor. And uh, Godspeed to all of you. And God bless America.